Good morning. My name is Pamela Vesel and I'm with Vermont Law School. Yep, I am very excited today to uh, introduce to you uh, our three panelists in the last uh, presentation panel uh, of the morning. Um, we have uh, uh, to begin with Esther Beraskovsky. So she's a litigator uh, of 30 years uh, in toxic tort litigation, among other things. Uh, she runs the uh, practice, pardon me, she runs the practice for her firm, uh, Motley Rice LLC in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, she's uh, prior to becoming an attorney, she was a clinical psychologist and consultant for efforts addressing post-traumatic stress and community trauma arising out of environmental disasters. So she has uh, approached um, the, the, the light of uh, environmental justice from multiple angles. She acquired her law degree from Rutgers Law School and in addition to environmental law cases, um, Ms. Beraskovsky has uh, frequently litigated cases involving medications and medical devices. She sits on the board of directors for public justice and the board of governors for the New Jersey Association of Justice. Um, Ms. Beras Beraskovsky frequently speaks and writes on the issues of environmental contamination, toxic, toxic exposure, product liability, and large-scale torts. And uh, I'm very excited to welcome her today. Um, in addition, then we will have uh, Dr. Uh, Madhavi Venkatsakan, uh, sorry, Venkatasan, my apologies. Uh, she will be speaking second, um, and her presentation is entitled Policy Management, Economic Literacy, and Stakeholder Engagement. Finally, we have uh, Professor Clifford Villa from the New Mexico School of Law and also formerly from the Environmental Protection Agency. Agency. And he will be discussing uh, community use of the um, EPA uh, CERCLA cleanup um, law or that part of CERCLA um, and how it uh, offers communities an opportunity to get far beyond just the bake sale model of fundraising and community cleanup. Uh, so I will introduce the second two panelists when it's time for them to present, but right now I'd really like to turn it over to Ms. Beraskowski. Thank you so much. Thank you and good morning and good to be with you. Um, notwithstanding the title of the panel, I will not be talking about policy per se, though I will try to address the question of how policy interfaces with other aspects of environmental work, such as litigation, which is what I do. And ask the question, do they, do they work in tandem or are they parallel? Are the goals sought to be achieved complementary? Are they antagonistic? Are they at odds with each other? And specifically, and important in most environmental litigation, the role, what role does science and medicine play in environmental policy making and in litigation? Perhaps most importantly, what is the interplay and what influences do they bring to bear on each other? Are there competing interests and are they sometimes at cross purposes where one works to the detriment of the other? And I'll talk about that more and how that is so. Uh, and most, most importantly, why does it matter? The fact is that litigation leads to policy changes and regulation. For example, seatbelts, asbestos, pharmaceutical and medical device regulations are good examples of that. The policies, the regulations, the prohibitions that arose they arose from litigation, um, specifically jury trials, which are bedrock in our constitution. And the right to a jury trial allows a different, a more egalitarian and more democratic assessment of information than is sometimes possible in having determinations made solely by an elite few um, and or corporate interests. Um, I am a trial lawyer. I represent people in communities that have contaminated as a result of corporate malfeasance, or in some cases, the very agencies that are charged with protecting people and the environment, such as Flint, Michigan. And while Flint rightfully has garnered a lot of national and international attention, the environmental injustice that's visited on low-income and minority communities is not unique to Flint. It happens in Alabama, in Cancer Alley in Louisiana, Newark, and other places as well. Um, we could spend an entire day talking about environmental injustice and uh, environmental racism, but just for the sake of brevity, it manifests in multiple ways, from the places that industrial facilities are located 
uh, from governmental response or lack thereof to pollution issues. The fact is that an exposure to toxic substances is disproportionately visited on communities of color and the poor, as is their effect on the health and, and environment. And, excuse me, there appears to be no limit to the hypocrisy that even the governmental, uh, the government resorts to. And I'll share with you a few particularly egregious uh, examples from Flint, uh, which include when the then governor, Rick Snyder, denying any claims that Flint's water was contaminated with lead, was simultaneously having bottled water shipped to the state's uh, uh, office buildings in Flint for state government workers or when General Motors switched its water supply because the Flint water was so corrosive that it literally corroded newly painted cars paid for by the state, all the while denying that the people of Flint, denying the people of Flint's uh, complaints regarding the lead contaminated water. Indeed, the residents of Flint were so poorly served by the state, uh, the then MDEQ, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality and the EPA against which we brought civil rights claims which survived judicial scrutiny by the Sixth Circuit because of the egregious nature of what happened in Flint. But again, Flint is not alone in that. Um, there was a task force, a state task force that was convened by the governor of Michigan uh, called the Flint Water Advisory Task Force and they issued a scathing report. And I'm gonna just read a little bit from it, from the summary because it I think aptly describes uh, the Flint water crisis is a story of governmental failure, intransigence, unpreparedness, de delay in action, and environmental injustice. The Michigan Department of Environmental Quality failed in its fundamental responsibility to effectively enforce drinking water regulations, and the Department of Health failed to adequately and promptly protect public health. Both agencies stubbornly worked to discredit and dismiss each other's attempt, dismiss others' attempts to bring the issues of unsafe water, lead contamination, and increased cases of legionnaires to light. That report was issued in 2016 by the state. And yet the state has engaged in nearly five years, five years of motion practice, delay, denial of responsibility, harassment of the class representatives. I'm class counsel on the executive committee for the litigation in Flint. Even using criminal charges brought against state agency personnel as shields to prevent them from having to testify, adding insult to injury. And it has just been a complete betrayal of a community by the very people charged with protecting them. Um, we ultimately did settle with the state not all that long ago, part, partly possible because of the change in the administration. Even though the process of getting final approval has still not happened, we're still, we've had final approval hearings the court and we anticipate that the judge will shortly be um, uh, entering a final approval order so that the claims administration can begin and people can begin to get uh, compensated. But the settlement in Flint is only with the state and we're continuing to litigate against some of the other defendants, the engineering companies uh, retained by the state for their role in the whole debacle. I will say about Flint that the story of the litigation, which will one day be told, is one which will reveal that the state's handling of it was another injustice, a trauma in and of itself. And as um, Professor um, Veselin mentioned, I, I'm a, also a psychologist, did, did a lot of work with uh, post-traumatic and community trauma. Uh, and, and one of the things in, in Flint, we raised the, as a claim community trauma. We had a world's leading expert talk about community trauma, testify about it. And the response from the defendants, including the state, was basically to trivialize that, and which has its own impact on the people um, of Flint. One reason I became a trial lawyer is to be able to address in a courtroom conditions where governments and corporations fail to live up to the kinds of ideals and values uh, which regulation uh, and legislation sought to provide that, for example, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, that everyone should be entitled to clean drinking water. From my perspective, the courtroom is the closest place we get to a level playing field. And to that end, until Wednesday of last week, I was scheduled to pick a jury this Monday, October 18th in Kent County, Michigan, in an environmental trial against 3M, 
and Wolverine. Wolverine's the company that manufactures hush puppies and other um, uh, water uh, protected, um, waterproof uh, clothing. Um, this case involves the contamination of the drinking water supply in the Rockford, Michigan area with PFAS. PFAS are per and polyfluoralkyl substances. They are a family of chemical, of carbon chain chemicals, also known as forever chemicals. And they're extremely persistent in the environment and they're persistent in the human body. Um, indeed, the levels in the people whose case I was about to try um, are just orders of magnitude higher than any maximum allowable levels. Michigan, as many other states have done, uh, recently lowered its levels. And just to give you some perspective, uh, lowered its levels of maximum allowable levels of PFAS in water from 70 parts per trillion to 16 parts per trillion. Vermont has, I think it's 14 or 20. Um, but these people's levels in their water was 20,000 parts per trillion. Um, similarly, their blood serum levels with PFAS, including two young adult uh, boys, um, were also off the charts. The trial would likely have lasted approximately four to six weeks and would have made public much of what 3M and Wolverine knew about the risks of PFAS to people, to aquatic life, to agriculture, and to the environment. And the case settled uh, just days before trial because the defendants, the responsible parties, did not want, in part, did not want the documents and the data that are still currently protected uh, to be made public. And another example of that was the Michigan Attorney General about four years ago brought a case against 3M and um, um, suing for natural resource damages. Um, and that case settled right before trial. And while I can't go into any details, the fact is there was data uh, that would have come out about that had, well, I'll just say, they settled for $850 million with the attorney general's office uh, not to go to trial. And there to date has not been a trial against 3M. This would have been the first, um, you know, sort of laying out the story of what they what they knew. Um, there are always risks associated with trial, which is why we do settle. And many factors um, affect the outcome of the trial. One of them is, you know, just the jurisdiction dictates both the law as well as the jury pool. In Western Michigan, for example, it's a very different jury pool than where I am in Philadelphia. Um, but circling back for a moment to policy, one of the biggest defenses in all of these cases, in all of the environmental cases, is that the science, the epidemiology, doesn't support a causal link between exposure and risk of harm. Why is that? Why is the science and the medicine still emerging? Why are there still no national standards for PFAS in you know, national standards here, federal standards. The truth is that companies like Wolverine and 3M and DuPont sell doubt. Doubt about the dangers to people and the environment of their products. And they do so by withholding and suppressing data, misrepresenting data, manufacturing data, and lobbying, powerful lobbying. And when caught, brought to trial, they pay only after protective confidentiality orders is, order is entered to keep everyone else in the dark. Um, because once you go to trial, once there's testimony about this, once we put it out there, it's out there and it's public. 3M lobbied, as did DuPont and other companies that manufactured PFOS containing products like Scotchgard and Teflon, excuse me, um, not to have the true risks of these products known for decades. And as a result, and because of that, the, the science is still emerging. One of the known effects of these chemicals is that they suppress the immune system, particularly in children. Um, a recent study do, done by one of the world's leading experts on PFAS, who happens to be somebody I work very closely with in a number of litigations, and also on behalf of both attorneys general and governmental entities representing them, as well as foreign uh, ministries I'm involved in actually represent the Flemish, the Belgian Ministry of Justice and Environment in a case against 3M uh, for, for pollution in Belgium. But uh, Philippe Grandjean is one of the leading experts uh, internationally. And a study he recently did suggests that people exposed to PFOS are more likely to be and more um, harmed by the impacts of COVID than those not exposed. 
And, and that has to do with the impact on the immune system, which we do know about PFOS. It does, it suppresses the immune system and it also affects the efficacy of vaccines, which is why it has that effect on, um, uh, you know, and that's why it, it relates to COVID as well. And, and the fact is that there is an explosion of research and many studies that are currently being conducted, but there were also studies done back um, uh, a few years back in the Ohio Valley. Some of you may have seen the movie Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo and Anne Hathaway, and it memorializes a story of uh, 17 years at Rob Lott, who actually is someone that I work with in the AFFF litigation, which is also PFAS, where it's aqueous film foaming foam, film forming phone, foam, which is used uh, to fight fires in, at airports and air forces. And that is actually the subject of multi-district litigation in South Carolina, but I digress. Um, uh, there, the film Dark Waters talks about DuPont for decades hiding the dangers of PFAS. And um, as a result of that, uh, the litigation that evolved uh, there was a study in the Ohio Valley of 70,000 people. And it was there was an advisory panel, a scientific advisory panel that was convened in order to do this study. And they determined that PFOS increases the risk for various conditions, including testicular cancer, kidney disease, immune suppression, and others. Um, the fact is that 3M knew as far back as the 60s and 1960s and 70s that these carbon chain chemicals pose a significant risk to human aquatic, agricultural, and environmental health. Uh, not only failed to disclose it to the regulatory agencies, but also to the communities in which it was disposed of and discharged. Um, in the United States, the ATSDR, the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Register, Registry, which is part of the CDC, has been evaluating these chemicals and reviewing the literature. And even in the most recent report in 2021, while they find an association because of, they look at a lot of the animal studies as well as human studies, does not conclusively establish that there is causation versus just an association. Nonetheless, every state is lowering the maximum allowable levels, New Jersey, Michigan, Vermont, Massachusetts, and others. Why is that? Because we know that exposure to these chemicals put people at risk. Um, and every day there are media reports of PFOS, uh, con about PFAS contamination. Um, but the proofs that you need in the courtroom that are required are a standard of certainty that is lagging. And the reason it's lagging is because the manufacturers of these chemicals have successfully kept the information they had, the studies from their own workers, from the public. And that's translated into billions of dollars in sales for these industries uh, during the time that they didn't disclose and the fact they were able to continue to manufacture. I'll just give you a, a very brief example uh, one of the things in uh, 3M sold PFAS to Wolverine um, over uh, a period of decades, 30 years, uh, 20, 20 plus years. Uh, at, at some point, uh, right before they were going to discontinue its use, they notified Wolverine that they were going to be discontinuing. So what does Wolverine do? Do they say, oh, my God, we better, you know, we've been discharging it into the community for, for, for years. We better, you know, notify people that there may be, you know, their water may be contaminated, their soil, their properties. No, they said to 3M, give us everything you've got. We want to buy everything you have, all the, the PFAS you have, and never told anybody. And then publicly said when all of this came to light and all the contamination came to light, said, oh, we didn't know anything about it. We had no idea. Um, I know that I'm running out of time. Uh, so I just want to, uh, the, the key is in, in litigation, the manufacturers of these chemicals argue to judges and juries every day that there's no basis for seeking either medical monitoring, or there's no basis for any injuries uh, for exposed people because the science is uncertain. And that begs the question, why isn't it? You know, we, they knew for decades we could have been looking at it for decades, both in terms of exposure to humans as well as developing remediation strategies. Um, the proofs that are necessary in law are a reasonable degree of medical and scientific certainty. It's a high standard. And one of the reasons that we, you know, we, that is a challenge now is because of the, the, the work that has not been done and the failure to disclose uh, these facts. And, um, you know, the fact is, 
it's not happenstance, it's not coincidental. Um, and without disparaging in any way the important work that the agency is charged with determining what the risks are associated with chemicals like PFAS or others, the APSDR, the NTP, National, um, Toxicolo National Toxicology Program, IARC, which is the International Agency for Cancer Research, and the EPA, the fact is that they are subject to powerful corporate influences. Um, as these corporations themselves generate data in some cases and conduct self-serving research, uh, which enters the body of the literature from which regulatory agencies make determinations about the nature of these substances. So, you know, all of that, uh, that affects policy. It affects, you know, how the length of time it takes to finally, you know, regulate some of these substances. Um, in addition to representing residents of communities, I also represent governmental entities for natural resource damages, claims for remediation and abatement. Um, and in many instances, polluters, you know, agree to clean up. Um, but, uh, you know, even with cleanup, it, we've, we've moved to risk management, but even that's not ideal. So some of the claims that one of the solutions has been um, to have to represent, you know, to, to work with attorneys general on suits for natural resource damages and specifically to restore affected resources mm -hmm. to their pre-pollution condition, which is called primary restoration, and also get compensation for the public's loss of use of these resources. One of the things about being a trial lawyer is that I get to make policy with jurors. Um, and it's one of the reasons that, uh, unfortunately, that corporations fund tort reform uh, legislation, and it's also why they fight for judges who use various mechanisms like Daubert challenges, which some of you have, you know, undoubtedly learned about in um, in your classes, um, or motions in limine, or different kinds of mechanisms to avoid jury trials. Um, so, you know, there is a, a you know the, the impact of what happens on a policy level affects the courtroom, but the reverse is also true. What we do in a courtroom, to the extent we're able to get to a jury and survive the kind of challenges uh, that lead up to trial, um, uh, it allows a lot of very important information to come out and for people to see what really happened and, and how much information is really out there um, that is kept confidential. Um, and I'll stop because I think I'm out of time, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Beroskovsky. I have uh, I have many questions for you, just myself, actually. And I and I know that every day I uh, teach and and meet with students here at Vermont Law School that very much uh, see themselves aspire to be uh, sitting in in your chair where you are and and doing the kind of work you're doing. So um, so I will uh, cede the floor and let them ask questions first. That's you enter your questions in the live stream chat box and we will save them all to the end of the panel and ask as many of them as we possibly can. So please bring those along. Next though, uh, I wanna introduce uh, Dr. Madhavi Vikatasen. Uh, you know, often missing from these discussions is, uh, is, is information, practical information about economic feasibility. And, uh, and so we are so pleased to introduce an economics uh, expert, a PhD. She received her uh, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate in economics from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Ben Patterson also received a master's in sustainability and environmental management from Harvard University, and a master's from uh, Vermont Law School in uh, environmental law and policy. She's currently a teaching professor at Northeastern University uh, and she's a founder and executive director of Sustainable Practices, a sustainability nonprofit in Massachusetts. Uh, I also know that she's authored numerous books and uh, and I have to say she's definitely put uh, my time management um, uh, skills to shame. But I welcome you, Dr. Van Kettison, and uh, uh, invite you to take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm having a little challenge in terms of pulling up my slides, so if you'll bear with me, I'll try to do that. Otherwise, I'll default to one of you to, to pull up my slides for me. But the first thing i just like to point out, and um, this is probably related to all the speakers that I've spoken today, uh, economics actually plays such a tremendous role in, in this whole discussion. And any kind of speaking of a solution without taking into consideration the economic components as to why we are where we are, 
in my opinion, unfortunately, will only be a very short-term salve, which uh, instead of being the cure that we're all hoping and, and desiring uh, to find. So may I first ask, can you see my slides? Excuse me, can yes, you see we my can. slides? Yeah, we can see you, your slides. Okay, perfect, thank you. So I, I would like to just start off with a discussion of, of economic literacy, then tie it back into the, the issues that have been spoken about today uh, including uh, in basically looking at corporations and their interests and why their interests perhaps maybe are independent of the interests of the whole or the general welfare of the public, because these are not norm these are not new issues that we're dealing with where uh, corporate interests or the desire for profitability takes into consideration short term gains over long term consequences, and uh, the primary reason probably tough for a lot of this is a divestiture of a sense of the individual from their there are three siloed components, which are the consumer, the investor, and a member of the government, which we will close with in this discussion. First of all, I just like to talk about economic literacy. I don't know, as an economist, it, it's often very um, shocking to me how many people want to stay away from the discussion about economics. Economics does not have to be about math. It is not a quantitative discipline in any form. It's actually more qualitative and more philosophical than anything. But if you look at the first quote that I have here, to found a great empire for the sole purpose of raising up a people of customers, may at first sight appear a project fit only for a nation of shopkeepers. It is, however, a project altogether unfit for a nation of shopkeepers, but extremely fit for a nation whose government is influenced by shopkeepers. And this is an important element to take into consideration because when we talk about our economy, our economy is based on growth and that growth does come from production. So it should be no surprise to us that we have the interests of the corporations exceeding the interests of the individual because that is the primary focus or goal of our economic system. If I could ask someone to please mute their line because there is some noise coming through. The second quote I have here is from the Minneapolis Fed. Nations benefit from having an economically literate population because it improves the public's ability to comprehend and evaluate critical issues. This understanding is especially important in democracies that lie on the active support and involvement of citizens. For all practical purposes, we do not live in a nation where we have active in economic literacy. In fact, 5% of college graduates graduate with some economics training in terms of some economics course. The sad thing about this is our economic system is our culture. Our economic system is basically how we are taught to behave from the very beginning of our lives to the end of our lives. And with the lack of understanding of it, we cannot necessarily change the very basis of the issues that we are talking about today at this forum. So economic literacy fundamentally is about how we live our lives here. We are in a consumer-based culture because consumerism is how our economy grows. And why is that important? Because economic growth is how we measure ourselves. We measure ourselves against other countries based on our production capacity. But quality of life is not tied to production capabilities. And we're seeing that very, very clearly today by looking at what's happening both in the climate change arena, as well as what we're seeing happening in our own backyards with regard to numerous pollutant impacts coming from overuse of natural resources and their disposal. So the purpose of an economy fundamentally is to establish well-being, happiness, cooperation, community, ensure resource distribution and promote continuity. All these things would be aligned to some aspect of sustainability. Our economy is somewhat far from this because though it could be based on the system that currently exists, what's missing in our economy is a sense of interconnectedness between each one of us. And in, in essence, we operate each of us in a silo looking for our own individual gratification. In a, and over time, over decadal time, over a four to five decade time period, we have become more and more individual in our behavior. And this was actually foreshadowed by President Jimmy Carter's 1979 Culture of Malay's State of the Union address, that we were becoming more polarized in terms of how we interacted with our neighbors. Our economic system is our culture. We are born to consume. Pro corporations are focused purely on profit maximization. And unfortunately, governments are in the business of making sure that they stay in business. So in other words, people are focused on their own reelection. The history of all of these silos, unfortunately, is not very well known or understood by many people. And the reason why we see so many environmental 
uh, aspects with regard to race in this country is because of the very fact that this country was not set up initially with the idea of all races or so-called ethnic races uh, being uh, being able to live here. This country was set up primarily for one particular group of people when they have lost use of others that they used for different labor purposes. And without taking that into consideration, names like Madison Grant and the, in, and the, and the actually inception of environmental racism can't be completely understood because the implicit nature of those elements continue to sit within our, our rules, legislations, institutions. So that being noted, the, the issue here is that we have an economic system which actually operates with the perception that the environment is a subset of the human system, as opposed to the human system being a subset of the environment. And this probably has a lot more to do with the social construction of our economic system, has a lot to do fundamentally with the perception of whoever was in power with regard to the significance of their power. But it is something because of our lack of critical engagement that we have continued to manifest generation after generation in our behavior with the environment. So these are the types of products that we create, and these are also the types of products that are out there. The question we have to ask ourselves are why were these products created to begin with, and why did we so blindly start purchasing them? And this is probably an area that we need to be working on interdisciplinarily in order to really completely understand, excuse me, but Facebook has actually illuminated some of this for us. It has a lot to do with the psychology of gratification. In many ways, the idea of somehow having our needs met at a particular time has become very habit forming. So we don't necessarily think about anything beyond the satiation of our immediate desires at that point in time. That means that we're not thinking necessarily about the value chain or the distribution across a life cycle. And this is really important because if economics is our culture, which I argue it is, if our economic framework is, then that means that the self-gratification has been embedded in each one of us, as well as the profit-seeking and profit-maximization as well. And what has been missing as the variable is any kind of interconnection or conscience, morality, empathy towards other individuals. In other words, this idea that my freedoms begin where yours end and yours begin where mine end, something that is cognizant of the rights of other humans, as well as the elements of the environment as well. So all of these right here are products that will never die, biodegrade, that go into landfills, and this has been discussed a little earlier, but the issue here of biodegradation and landfills is, is really interesting because when you think about the initial reason for burying trash, it was because we were consuming organic materials, but we aren't today. And the fact that we consider ourselves to be a sophisticated or progressed society, and we dig a hole line it with plastic, dump products in it that are made of synthetic substances that do not have the capacity for biodegradation, fill it, then on top of it, put another layer of plastic, put pipes to eliminate the methane as well as to drain out the rainwater that accumulates, which we then eventually push that toxic substance into the ocean and then sod it and put solar panels on top should beg a question as to how sophisticated we truly are or how much of it is our sophistication is really just about putting it out of sight. So this is an area where I think it's really important to talk about because this is this will this will be the segue to the latter portion of my discussion, which is we are at a situation point right now where people are wondering what the, what they can do to be part of this change, but feeling very powerless in doing so. Unfortunately, there's a lot of finger pointing at the government being the one that needs to step in to regulate, to corporations as being these evil entities, but there's not always a recognition that the fact fundamentally is also that the consumer is looking for the cheapest price to buy the most that they want. Also, at the same time, whatever, whoever has a retirement savings, mutual fund, any kind of product is looking for the highest yield. And little weight, if any, is ever put on in the type of community values that your elected officer will have. And unfortunately, even less weight is put on local politics relative to national. So in every way, as the individual citizen, we do not exercise the authority that we have to actually make the difference in the, in the realm that we can. The other part of it is unfortunate too. The country that actually has created the majority of the problems, which is the United States, is the one that's least understanding overall of the need for the changes that need to happen. So here we have some countries listed with regard to the environmental impact and sensitivity to issues. But what you'll see very clearly here is those countries that are considered developing and oftentimes have a higher rate of concern. And this is an issue because when we think about it, if 
the country that is the problem can't recognize the problem that it has. How can those countries that are developing be the salve for this issue? And I'm gonna talk about that very briefly in one second. So the purpose of education can be multi, tactical, political, cultural obedience. Unfortunately, we don't spend enough time on the last one, which is critical engagement or critical thinking. And so people are focused only on knowing what they have to know to get through to the next step. It is the critical engagement element with regard to why we have the waste that we have today that's extremely important. Products are developed, they're natural resource intensive because everything is. The moment you make a salad, you've already increased the resources compared to the piece of lettuce that you could have just easily consumed. The extraction of raw materials has an impact on the eco ecosystem and other species. Most of the time we don't take into consideration those species because we've adopted a mentality that somehow we are the dominant species and therefore they're being lesser are less important. We are starting to recognize very, very slowly that we need those other species in order to maintain the ecosystems that we thrive on. So we have design and production to make things look attractive, but because there is no externalized cost that's being captured in these processes, those costs that are in the design and production elements only take into consideration what our labor costs or whatever costs us money to the production process. Anything that we can regulate that we there is no regulation for, we are able to externalize the environment or other people. Other people who typically are disenfranchised and disenfranchised by historical segregation and marginalization. Then we use it, we use the products. Consumers, unfortunately, because we have had a history of not electing people necessarily that are out there looking for consumer interest, but looking at least, as we said, the first slide, shopkeeper interest, we end up having products that are coming to market that don't recognize a precautionary principle, but instead are more reflective of speed to market, which means that litigation is the only way to get the product off. And because the firm is focused primarily on its profit making or profit taking, it's going to do everything in its silo to try to maintain and protect its profits. In the interim, we may eliminate one product only to have another very similar product come back on the market. So obviously litigation may be helpful, but it is not the solution. When we look at disposal, we have the same issue. Disposal can go be, be a three different channels. You can have incineration, which is called waste to energy. Unfortunately, this is also why you have pay, pay as you throw. Pay as you throw is a Covanta CMAT. CMAS is the, the, the collection facility here in Massachusetts. But basically, it is an incineration facility. What we are doing is burning our trash, which we don't know the composition of. We know the composition of coal. We don't know the composition of trash. So you can see the amount of risk that take that will actually embed into our system if we increase the amount of trash that we burn. The other alternative is recycling and then landfilling. Recycling is a salve that will not be a long-term fix. Majority of products can only be recycled at the most two or three times. The additional aspect is, especially if you're talking about plastic, plastic recycling requires virgin plastic, which will not stop the machine of plastic creation. And most recycled plastic is downcycled, which means it adds the plastic in our environment. Plastic is a toxic substance, both to humans as well as animals, and it should not be continued to be perpetuated under the myth that recycling will work. These are products that need to be eliminated. We lived without them. We need to think about living without them again. And we need to think about looking at products that take into consideration risk tolerance. So instead of having to litigate a product off the market, we upfront use a precautionary principle of having to prove that a product is not harmful when it comes to market. Finally, right here, prices reflect a level of exploitation. So what, what I'm saying when I say this to you is that right now people have this unfortunate perception that prices give you a right to purchase something without the responsibility uh, inherent in, in its consumption or your choice to purchase it. Prices are unfortunately reflective of whoever has a stronger market demand, whether it's the consumer or the producer. And unfortunately, it's usually the producer. So that means somewhere along the line, someone is being exploited and most likely it's another human being and it's the environment. So the more that we choose to purchase and we look for the cheaper the price, not only are we over consuming, or also underpaying what things are worth. So looking at a global GDP level, you can see GDP has continued, continued to rise ever since its inception in 1940s as a, as a world or global indicator. It has had a very strong and parallel trajectory to carbon emissions in the world. The US dominates cumulative carbon emissions, which goes to my earlier point about the US being very important in this whole conversation. And the other part here is if we look here, right at this red line going up, 
That is a 70 years since the GDP metric, which has run on energy, which is dependent on energy, has come into being. So these are aspects of how we have chosen to live. Again, hopefully honing in on that point that I've tried to make that the economy is the issue here, how we choose to consume, how we choose to grow it. One of the primary mechanisms or easiest mechanisms to grow an economy is planned or perceived obsolescence. And most of our products in terms of consumer products are actually in that level. These are all single use products and all these single use products have adverse consequences to the environment and human health. And on top of it are also mechanisms to grow the economy because the moment you use it, you have to replenish it. So this takes me to my organization, Sustainable Practices. We instituted a commercial single-use plastic water bottle ban across all 15 towns on the Cape as of 2020. As of 2021, uh, July, we have passed the 15 towns, all 15, the municipal single-use plastic water bottle ban, which prohibits town government purchase of single-use plastic bottle beverages and uh, with town money and the sale of beverages in pl single-use plastic containers on town property. The second is not true in all towns, but in majority of them. It was our segue to actually start the 2020 campaign about the single-use plastic water bottle ban. That was specifically geared towards eliminating what 60% of the beverage market in a tourist economy has a tremendous impact, adverse impact to us. Though there may be a market for some commoditized single-use plastic, the reality is no community and no state determines the overall commodity market. The overall commodity market for this product is basically related to the prices of oil. And even though it was mentioned earlier that you could mandate that a corporation then have to use a certain amount of recycled material, that does not eliminate the problem. The problem still continues to persist because you still have the plastics. Not everything is going to be recycled. We know that 9% of all plastics have been recycled in the world up to this point, 22% on an average basis with regard to single-use plastic bottles. So recycling is not the solution here. The elimination of this product is, the elimination of the comedian's mindset is what we argue for with my organization. So our proposed bylaw basically says that you cannot sell a single-use plastic water bottle effective a certain date. Seven of them have been in effect as of September of this year. The other three will be coming into effect um, in December of this year, and we're we're going to be voting on another one on Monday night. Uh, there is a there is oh, no way to actually have any kind of bylaw without an enforcement vehicle. So there is an enforcement vehicle, and press is our friend because the more that people know about this, the more that there is pressure in order to ensure that there's compliance. So their status I've already shared with you, and these have all been passed. The 11 that we're looking at right now have all have been passed at a town meeting, which I'm sure that you're familiar with. So as I conclude, I'd like to just state this. Each citizen is a consumer, investor, and a voter. It's working together across those three components that have individually become silos that is important. Divestiture is not an answer. What the answer is instead is to be part of the shareholder, the activist shareholder base, go to, tell, go to your annual meeting of shareholders and demand that the changes occur in the compensation scheme of, of the senior management team. Fiduciary responsibility should be inclusive of sustainability parameters. And this has actually been done now just recently with a very small activist shareholder group at ExxonMobil. Additionally, consumers need to be cognizant and take some responsibility, but it is very true that there are different levels of educational understanding across this country and across any community. That's why in certain cases, bans have to be put into effect. In other cases, you have to have different aspects with combination of regulation as well as outreach and education. The fundamental reason why we picked a life cycle impact of plastic single use plastic water bottles is because it's the most tangible product out there on the market and everyone has come into contact with it. We believe that if by showing people, if they could start to think about the life cycle impact of all of their choices, they may start to actually incorporate that in their decision making. The one thing that's extremely important here as I conclude is you have to understand that in our reduction of consumption we affect the GDP and our economy, our whole system is set up to get us to be marketed to consume more. So I hope you will see how it's very important to have some basic economic literacy because we will be pushed, be pushed, pushed back on our desire to change our consumption patterns if we don't understand that that desire of changing consumption patterns also has to do with a desire to change what we are measuring as being economic well-being. We have to change that measure simultaneous if we're really going to attain the things that we want to attain with the urgency that's required. 
So this last statement from Adam Smith summarizes one comment that I hope you'll take into consideration and one thought you will take too. Economics is not purely a quantitative discipline, it is a qualitative one. We are a moral philosophical discipline that in its root and foundation believe that there is a conscience and morality that dictates people's behavior. Unfortunately, Adam Smith has been cited a lot, but read very little, so he's been cited inappropriately and incorrectly many, many times. But with that, I thank you so much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Venkatasan. That was fascinating. And um, I uh, want to remind our audience about the uh, questions of the, in the chat section of the live stream. We already have one, and we're going to um, we're going to go a few minutes after uh, our designated stop time uh, because I want to give plenty of time to Professor Via. Clifford Via is presently a professor of law at the University of New Mexico School of Law. He received a BA in English and Economics from the University. Uh, of, I'm sorry, he, he received a, a BA in English and Economics from University of New Mexico and his JD from Lewis and Clark. Uh, prior to joining the faculty at University of New Mexico, he spent two decades working at the US Environmental Protection Agency, uh, serving in numerous roles as a uh, a public service attorney, he received multiple awards for his commendable performance in, and uh, at the, both the US EPA and at the Department of Justice. He also has uh, taught environmental law and disaster law at Seattle University School of Law. Um, I, I welcome Professor Via and uh, again, welcome your questions after uh, the conclusion of the third presentation. Take it away. All right, thank you, Pamela. And maybe, um... Carol, if you could call up my PowerPoint at this point, we'll take a look at that. And uh, in the interim, while I did have a BA in economics, I obviously need to read Adam Smith a lot more than I have. So I'm looking forward to going back and doing that when, when I have a chance. Um, okay, I'm not seeing much of the PowerPoint. Do you, can you maximize that, Carolyn? Or I'm seeing a thumbnail version of that. Carolyn, if you could hear me, I'm only seeing a thumbnail version of the PowerPoint, unless other people are seeing the full screen. Um, okay, well, I, I can just barely see it, but I'm gonna trust that other people are, are seeing more than, than what I'm seeing. Um, what you might be seeing on the first slide is a trail that's much better thank you carolyn across the panhandle of northern idaho um this is an an old uh railroad right-of-way that served the mining industry of northern idaho for 100 years and when the mining industry went away um the railroads also sort of abandoned their service and that railroad right-of-way now is this beautiful bike trail this bike trail was actually constructed through legal authority under the federal Superfund law, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, better known as CERCLA. There is a full panel on CERCLA, I understand, later this afternoon. Um, but really, I wanted to talk about CERCLA because I think it does provide a very powerful authority and resources for addressing concerns about waste and contaminated sites. And I believe that authority is often overlooked. If you can go to the next slide, uh, Carolyn, um, the next slide is, is a, uh, a program, uh, an, an annual conference at the University of Oregon, uh, the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference, and I've attended it uh, almost every year for more than 20 years. Um, and it's interesting, I'm often sitting in the back row and, and listening to conversations. And this one was a conversation about how to clean up brownfield sites, contaminated sites in communities. And I sat there and listened for a while to a lot of discussions about fundraising ideas, about how communities can raise money uh, to clean up their contaminated sites, including the use of bake sales. Um, things I love like uh, the lemon bars that might be featured in slide number two. Um, so listening to that, I thought, well, I was actually an attorney who represented, among other things, our Superfund program. And there was a specific program for a cleanup of contaminated sites under Superfund known as the removal program. 
um, and it provides funding uh, uh, to uh, for EPA and its contractors to go and clean up sites. And and some of those cleanups can be performed rather quickly within a matter of days or hours. Um, there are people who have uh, resources and vehicles and training, and they wait around for your phone call in warehouses. Um, in my office of EPA Region 10 in Seattle, our group was charged with conducting at least 20 removal actions in a year. Um, and uh, and they can do more than that, but they, they should not be doing less. And yet, I think there's most people would not have any idea about the availability of these authorities. And I learned later that it wasn't just um, some community activists who were completely unaware of the Superfund removal program, but there's a lot of lawyers and law professors out there. I, I spoke on another panel earlier this year um, at another school, and uh, and I got a lot of questions that told me that a particular law professor had no idea of the existence of the Superfund removal program. And so I thought it might help to share what this program is about and what it could do. Can we go to the next slide, please, slide three? I'm also just seeing these slides rather unfocused. <laughs> Maybe um, uh, people are seeing it a little better, but. Uh, if you don't know, there is a super fund. Um, you may know it as a statute, but it is actually a, uh, an account um, in the U.S. Treasury uh, established by federal statute that you see here known as the Hazardous Substance Super Fund. Next slide, please. That account was originally funded by a tax on the oil and gas uh, uh, industry. Uh, the tax expired in 1995, but it is still funded today. Um, by congressional appropriations, annual congressional appropriations, as well as by recoveries from uh, responsible parties in negotiated settlements and judgments. And so that fund is, has been fairly stable um, and is replenished over time and remains available for providing cleanups across the country under the Superfund program, both large and small. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm hoping that you could vaguely see some citations here. Uh, this is a citation to section 104 uh, C that talks about limit um, a dollar limitation on Superfund removal authorities. And the basic idea here is that Superfund funding for cleanup is presumptively capped at $2 million or 12 months. So EPA can spend up to $2 million on a site from the Superfund uh, account unless they uh, they invoke some kind of exemption. Slide six, please. Um, now, these this is a limitation on funding from the fund, that is, from, from the Superfund. Um, there is no limitation on uh, expenditures that may be provided by another party. So slide seven, please. To go back to the uh, initial um, opening, slide seven. Slide seven is a picture of that same railroad right of way that was um, converted from a railroad uh, right of way to recreational trail. And it was funded by the Union Pacific Railroad under a consent decree, a settlement with EPA, the Department of Justice, and the Coeur d'Alene Tribe. Um, the uh, the railroad wanted to transfer the right of way because they weren't using it as a right of way anymore, and they wanted to be absolved of responsibility. But the right of way was contaminated. Thank you. That looks much better. Um, the railroad was contaminated. They couldn't transfer it until they cleaned it up and and dressed all the metals that they had spilled over a hundred years. So the railroad eventually negotiated an agreement to clean up the right of way and to cap it with this lovely asphalt that becomes a a bike trail. This cleanup ultimately cost the railroad about $50 million. Um, and it's perfectly fine for a responsible party to spend as much money as it wants to um, under the Superfund program. The cap on funding from the Superfund is, is, uh, is only a limit when EPA is spending the money, um, not a limit when private parties are. So $50 million is, is perfectly fine if that's what the, uh, the uh, responsible party here wanted to, uh, to settle for. So great. Next slide, please. So if EPA is spending the money, um, there is a presumptive $2 million cap, but there's two important exceptions to that. One is in the case of something known as an emergency, we'll talk about what, what that looks like. And two, 
if the site is on the national priorities list, that is, if the site is designated as a federal Superfund site. So next slide, please. Emergency is pretty much what you uh, would think it is. Um, here is an example of emergency authority that EPA used. This is um, a, a, a mine site, a processing site uh, around Libby, Montana. Libby, Montana in 1999 was discovered to be heavily contaminated with asbestos from uh, this WR Grace facility. Uh, it was not listed as a Superfund site at the time, but EPA began immediate um, emergency response to address the asbestos contamination. At least 300 people had died from asbestos-related uh, diseases at this point, and perhaps 3,000 um, are continuing to suffer from it today. This is a classic emergency. EPA eventually did more than $50 million of, of cleanup under its removal authority. Uh, next slide, please. And appropriately, um, under the statute, it sued WR Grace for recovery of those costs. That uh, case actually reached a rare uh, published decision by the Ninth Circuit. And when the Ninth Circuit looked at this, it found that this is exactly what this circle authority is for. The court wrote, the population of Libby and nearby communities, which the EPA estimates about 12,000, faces ongoing pervasive exposure to asbestos particles being released through documented exposure pathways. We cannot escape the fact that people are sick and dying as a result of this exposure. Um, WR Grace argued that EPA should not have gone beyond the $2 million cap. And the court said, no, this is exactly why you would uh, allow an uh, uh, exemption for emergency, especially when people are sick and dying. $50 million was um, perfectly appropriate for EPA to spend in this case, and WR Grace was charged with that expense. Next slide, please. So here's another example of emergency. People may remember the blowout of the Gold King mine spill in August of 2015 that was caused by EPA contractors who were investigating that mine and outrushed 3 million gallons of contaminated water. And we saw scenes like this for the next couple of weeks. This is the Amos River near Durango. Um, EPA spent more than $30 million and emergency response over the next couple of months responding to that spill. Um, and that, again, was perfectly appropriate. There is no question about the emergency status of this as well. Next slide, please. So um, two exemptions from the $2 million cap. One, for an emergency. Two, for a site that's listed on the national priorities list. That is a site that has gone through a formal rulemaking process to list it as a designated Superfund site. This is the Coeur d'Alene Mining uh, Superfund site um, centered around Kellogg, Idaho, but it, it also includes the river that flows through it. Um, here you see the river on a high water day just moving tons of sediment with tons of lead and zinc into Coeur d'Alene River. EPA has spent easily more than $250 million on this site. Sites that are listed on the NPL are, um, typically run in the hundreds of millions of dollars. $500 million is, is, is not um, extraordinary for a mining site. That is exactly what the Superfund Fund uh, can do in the absence of other responsible parties able to pay. Next slide, please. So, oh, one more, back up, there you go. Um, so the Superfund Authority is generally triggered by a release of a hazardous substance. Um, there are a broad category of hazardous substances, including a long list in regulations and things regulated by RICRA and the Clean Water Act. One thing that is not included in Superfund authority are um, petroleum products, uh, oil, crude oil, natural gas, um, something called the petroleum exclusion. Next slide, please. That means that you cannot use uh, Superfund money for cleaning up sites that look like this, old abandoned uh, gas stations that you see along the highways, sometimes in neighborhoods. You can expect that there were uh, gasoline tanks at one point that leaked into the soil. You often see scenes like this because uh, there's just no economic incentive to clean this up, and there's no access to the Superfund to clean up either. This might be a great case for state uh, authorities to use their own um, mechanisms to clean up, or uh, or possibly lenders who are willing to uh, to understand the risks involved and still find it to be a, a worthy investment. But you see a lot of abandoned railroad uh, gas stations like this because of the circle of petroleum exclusion. Next slide, please. Now. Um, Sometimes there are, is a possibility of cleaning up old gas stations and other uh, oil contaminated facilities under other grant mechanisms. Superfund does actually have a, a ground 
a program of uh, grants for assessment and cleanup of what are known as brownfields. This was an old gas station in a neighborhood of Portland, Oregon, and they received a brownfields grant to do the assessment and contribute to cleanup. And now it is a wonderful community center. Um, so EPA could not have spent cleanup money, but the community itself applied for a grant and they got the, the work done here. Next slide, please. Now, Esther mentioned in, in her comments, Flint, Michigan, I've spent some time studying um, uh, concerns about Flint. I'd love to have a longer conversation with Esther and others about that. But it raises some questions about whether or not a Superfund could be used in any way to address the drinking water contamination with Flint. I think the short answer is probably not, um, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you why. So among other things, you, you probably know that the water that, that came from the Flint River um, corroded pipes, released lead that was in the pipes, so lead ends up in the drinking water. Um, you see a lot of color like this one, a lot of iron um, rust along with, with lead and, and other sort of nasty things. Uh, next slide, please. There is an interesting sort of um, exclusion to uh, response authority under CERCLA. Um, you, CERCLA can't be used to respond to a naturally occurring substance like uh, uh, asbestos um, in an altered form. It can't be used to respond to releases from um, structures, building structures. Think of lead paint inside a, being released inside an old apartment or house. Um, and it also can't be uh, used to address releases into public or private drinking water supplies through deterioration of the system through ordinary use. Now, query whether the switch of the drinking water in Flint was indeed ordinary use or was extraordinary. Um, Congress knew that uh, there was a problem with drinking water infrastructure when they wrote this into the statute. They knew that, that systems were deteriorating or the releases of, of iron and other metals into those drinking water systems. I don't know that they were anticipating release of lead um, much less bacteria. Um, it's hard to address uh, drinking water supplies through CERCLA, but there is an exception to the exception that is sort of curious. So next slide, please. The exception to the exception says, notwithstanding all the above, the president through EPA may respond if in the president's discretion, it constitutes a public health or environmental emergency and no other person with authority and capability to respond to the emergency will do so. Um, in the case of uh, Libby, Montana, W.R. Grace, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry might have had the, uh, the interest, but they had no authority to respond to the asbestos emergency. And that's one reason why EPA did respond there. Uh, in the case of Flint, there were a lot of other agencies that did respond. FEMA responded initially. Um, there were national orders. The state of Michigan started providing water supplies. So EPA did not have to exercise its circle authority to, address, to respond to Flint. Um, but the next time it conceivably could. So I uh, might keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this is the way that the circular removal program is supposed to work. Um, if we could back up one. Uh, in April of 2007, the EPA Region 10 office received a call on the emergency line um, about two boys in the hospital with acute mercury poisoning. EPA sent this response vehicle over the mountains from Seattle to Yakima, Washington, um, which is a, a heavily agriculture and Latino community. And, uh, and when they arrived, next slide, please. Um, they found this home uh, where the boys lived and it was heavily contaminated with mercury. Next slide, please. Mercury is designated as a hazardous substance under CERCLA and the guys in the moon suit entered the home. Next slide, please. And what they found inside was that mercury vapors had permeated every porous surface. It permeated uh, the mattress. It permeated the paint in the wall um, in the background here. Next slide. Mercury vapors permeated the entire home and the entire home had to be taken apart from the inside out, all of the kitchen surfaces and cabinets. Next slide, please. Mercury vapors had even permeated the floor and the subfloor and gone down into the earth beneath the house, all of which had to be removed. Next slide, please. So um, you might wonder where the mercury came from. Here's a guy using a really interesting device uh, um, and, uh, and he's literally following a, a trail of mercury vapors <laughs> around the neighborhood, um, which is uh, again, heavily Latino. And next slide, please. Um, they find the source of the mercury, which is this shed. 
where there was a Coke bottle full of mercury that uh, children in the neighborhood were playing with. Um, obviously very dangerous. Obviously we want to know who else has been playing with it. We have two kids in the hospital by this point as well. Next slide. So the cleanup of this entire home um, cost a lot of money. Uh, it, it, you might just uh, guess what, what this might this house might be worth in a very poor neighborhood of, uh, of a very poor town. Um, and the cleanup costs substantially more than the market value of this house. Next slide. Um, according to public records, the cleanup of this site, of this site cost uh, at least $400,000. I think it was well over $500,000, honestly. Um, if you looked at, at this particular house on Zillow today, you'd find a, a estimated value of $153,000. Um, and you might ask why the government would spend um, four times as much on cleanup as the market value of the house. But that leads to a discussion, next slide please, of environmental justice. And this is the uh, definition of environmental justice that EPA has used for more than 20 years. And notice it begins with the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people. Environmental justice really is focused on public health. It is not focused on necessarily ecological systems. And it is not focused on um, market value. It's not focused on property. It is focused on people. And to protect the people in that community in Yakima, Washington, did in fact require cleanup. If EPA had simply not done anything at all, um, it would still be a threat to the, the community. Uh, whether or not you have yellow tape around it forever, kids would still be playing on that property and they would be exposed to mercury. And having a contaminated home would certainly depress the economic value of all of the properties around it. So EPA made the decision subject to criticism for investing the money to clean up that home and did. Next slide, please. So if you look at that same neighborhood through available GIS tools like EJ Screen, which is available to you now, um, you would see that that home is sort of in an area that is identified as sort of a classic environmental justice community. You could look at uh, properties through environmental indicators like the index for particulate matter, and you see that it's the 98th percentile nationally for particulate matter. You see it's in the 97th percentile for ozone. Um, you see it's in the 96th percentile for respiratory hazards and, and, and on, on 99th percentile for lead paint. Um, people who live there, even without the mercury contamination, were already being exposed to an awful lot of pollutants that were affecting their health, and they certainly could not allow one more toxic site in their community. Next slide, please. You can also look at the very same site through demographic factors. Um, and uh, some of those demographics are indicated here. It's in the 98th percentile regionally for people of color, 99th percentile for low income, 99th percentile linguistic isolation. This is sort of exactly the concern that we have recognized for environmental injustice where heavily polluted places are gonna be most likely located in communities of color, low income. Um, exactly why we need to focus on concerns like environmental justice and Superfund authority is one of those authorities we can use. Next slide, please. So um, uh, just to, uh, to come to the conclusion, I've spent a lot of time looking at environmental justice through many different lenses, through civil rights, through regulatory programs. Um, there is a chapter on uh, environmental justice and Superfund in, in this book, but I'm very excited to see in research for the book and continuing research now that people are finding many ways to address concerns for environmental justice, environmental problems generally. Um, just one more to add to the mix I hope you'll take from today is that there is money available through the Superfund removal program, even if the site is not listed and never listed as a designated Superfund site. If it meets the jurisdictional triggers of release of hazardous substance, it could probably be subject to funding with or without fake sales. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, and I do have a few questions, and uh, but I want to start for one, with one that I received. It's really for, uh, for our first and third speakers, for, for Esther and, and Cliff. When, if, a, if it is 
true that we have this this resource available um, uh, for EPA funded cleanup of smaller uh, contaminated sites within a community. Um, and let's say a, a, a grassroots organization decides that it wants to try and clean up a, an abandoned lot and they call this, um, but that, that down the line, it looks like there's going to be potentially some civil toxic tort litigation. What happens when um, that phone call is made to the EPA as it relates to the collection of evidence that could be used against the, uh, the, the bad actors here? Is it wise to yeah, involve an attorney immediately? Right. That's not a, um, an uncommon question. But if you look at at least from a policy standpoint, I think anybody would agree that if you can remove the, the ongoing contamination, you should do that and you should do that first. Um, and, uh, and there will be records. Of course, EPA will maintain records, contractors. Part of the reason why you have that big mobile rig is, is there's an accountant who sits in there um, and literally documents all of the expenses that are being incurred by the, uh, the contractors, for example. Um, and that creates a record. Those will be public records that can be used in, in many different ways as well. But one thing that we have learned through cases like um, uh, the contamination in, in Massachusetts, that was the subject of a civil action. People may know the book or the movie starring John Travolta. Um, you have an attorney who's maxing out credit cards in order to conduct hydrogeological studies of this contaminated site affecting people. The answer there was it should be, and it ultimately was, a designated Superfund site. And EPA spent millions of dollars, of course, WR Grace, that same company in, in, in Lou, Montana, to end up footing the, the bill. So um, doing cleanup with Superfund Authority doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't mean that you could not follow up with any kind of tort litigation or, or other sort of action. But it does mean that you can get a, perhaps a faster start on addressing the heart of the, of the ongoing problem because you don't want things to get worse. I'd like to also, if you don't mind, address that. We've learned a lot since the civil action. I happen to know Jan Schlickman very well, was actually involved with litigation. Uh, I was a law student then in, in Sacramento. We used the same experts. But uh, Jan Schlickman, who was the attorney that um, Cliff is referring to, was my co-counsel in the Toms River Children's Cancer Cluster uh, matter which we did, we handled very, very differently. We decided not to litigate and we devolved, uh, designed a resolution process. But, but anyway, we've learned a lot since those days. And typically, and I would say for the most part, environmental litigation, we use the data that's generated by the regulatory agencies like the EPA, depending whether the EPA or the state uh, regulatory agency is the lead agency or sometimes they work together, but we use a lot of the data and they really, um, that, that is generated in the testing because the testing is prohibitively costly. We used to try to do, and in some cases may do some very limited testing, but for the most part we rely on as, you know, when we pursue litigation on behalf of um, residents of communities or class actions of, of that nature, we rely on the data that's generated from the cleanup, from the testing that's done by either the EPA or New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection or whatever the um, regulatory agency is. Uh, that said, um, when I'm working on natural resource damages cases on behalf of attorneys general, obviously we have access to um, you know, all of the data right away. Uh, and it's based on that data that we're pursuing claims either for primary or compensatory restoration. But uh, it's, it's a bit, you know, it's, uh, it's a really important for the remediation uh, to proceed. I do want to mention one thing that PFAS, those chemicals that I mentioned, you know, the per um, and polyfluoroalkyl uh, compounds are still not regulated under CERCLA. Um, it's, you know, it's now the EPA is considering them, but those are not regulated yet. Yeah. Can I follow up on, on that one? Because that, that is true and intriguing. And I think it's a very useful note for students. Um, according to the EPA, PFAS is not regulated by CERCLA, also not regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act, although there's a health advisory, but not regulation. There is a very broad category of authority, though, under CERCLA for addressing another uh, uh, category of pollutants known as pollutants or contaminants, um, which are defined very narratively 
as things that can kill people, including disease-causing agents and, and, uh, and things that can harm with exposure and ingestion. EPA obviously doesn't want to use that pollutant or contaminant authority to address PFAS because it might just mean that they need to start dealing with PFAS sites across the country. But if you look at their website, they at least acknowledge that it is an authority. And if there were uh, interested people inside the agencies to start using that authority, I think they probably could, um, although I understand why they're probably not anxious to do that right now. If I could right, make a comment there are... with regard to PFAS, may I make one comment with regard to PFAS, please? Um, you, there's a ubiquitous nature of PFAS, and it goes to tra traces back to the use of Teflon, Gore-Tex, and other types of, of any kind of um, uh, water repellent type material. And today we have it currently used in any kind of a fire station when you're trying to put out a fire. It is noted that probably every single human on this planet is contaminated with PFAS in their blood. So this is what also makes this particular product very challenging. Additionally, though you can remove some aspects of PFAS using carbon filtration systems, others you can't. So I would imagine there's a certain element of the uncertainty as well as in terms of threshold, as well as a, the fact that this is a, a class of chemicals, not one particular chemical that we're dealing with. If if Thank I can respond so to that. that. Oh, okay, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I, you're absolutely, I absolutely agree. Um, it's ubiquitous. It is not naturally occurring. And I think that's a very important distinction. And just in terms of, you know, to the extent that yes, because it was used in popcorn, uh, the inside of po uh, microwave popcorn containers, pizza boxes, there is a baseline, unfortunately, in uh, the national population, but it's pretty low. It's still in the 1.4, 1.6. What we're seeing in the biomonitoring studies that are being done around the country are levels in people. For example, some of the kids that I represent have levels of thousands of parts uh, per billion in their blood serum. So, you know, they're it is true and it is very difficult to remediate and it is very, very difficult to, in part because of its persistence, but in part because the carbon filtration, uh, you know, osmosis, those uh, types of um, remediation are, they haven't been fully developed and they're not, uh, they're not as effective as the ones that, you know, for VOCs or other types of uh, constituents. Unfortunately, I think we have to stop there. Uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, there's so much more that, that um, I want to know from, from you. Um, and we got a, one interesting question about whether an informed consumer is uh, more likely to be a sustainable consumer. And uh, it's something for all of us to think about uh, as we move forward, because um, I think uh, just because uh, People know what is in what you know what what is in their water repellent clothing doesn't necessarily always mean they're going to make those types of choices. Would you agree with that, Madavi? Well, I think there, there's a combination of not just being informed, but also having cultural a cultural value that we all have as a community that also uh, reaffirms the need to actually not only be informed but to take decisions that are beneficial to the whole rather than just to the individual. So what we're talking about when we talk about sustainability is actually a transformation, a transformation that's already starting to happen. We're seeing it in, in small pockets across the United States. And in those communities, it, it can be actually actively reinforced. That's why you're seeing community activism and action with even things like single use plastic water bottles. The question is, is how are we gonna engage those individuals who believe freedom comes without responsibility? And um, that, that to me is one of the issues with regard to our educational system. I uh, obviously didn't have a chance to speak to a lot of things, but one aspect would be that we have instituted a nation where freedom is not defined and responsibility is not uh, given as part of being a citizen. And when you, when you have a situation like this, it's very hard to re-engage a public that doesn't feel like they have any need to be cohesive with the, with the whole. Uh, and I think that's the biggest challenge in this country at this point in time, is how do we create and establish engagement across the constituency of individuals who have varying understanding of what it means to be part of a nation. Thank you so much to all my panelists. Those are uh, those are important words for us to stop with. I, I'm I'm afraid we have to, but uh, really, uh, I really appreciate the time that you took uh, to be with us on the Saturday. I know that uh, the students and and other 
members of our audience feel the same. And I'll give this to you, Carolyn. I think you're muted, Carolyn. You're muted. I think she's still muted, but now I feel better that she gets to, I get to see it be on the other side of that since I usually feel like that's my problem. <laughs> so, uh, should we, uh, can I give any instructions on your behalf? We will break for now for lunch and return at 1.45 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.